Okay, thank you everyone for joining us, joining us this evening for our town hall. My name is Mary Lee. I am the chair of the Frederick County Democratic Party. Our central committee wanted to host this conversation about Project 2025. I have just a few introductory comments and then we'll go right into our presentations. First, um, if anyone needs closed captioning, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see um, the CC button. Click on that and that will allow you to have closed captioning. Uh, you can set it to English um, and it will do closed caption just for you. However, there is um, closed captioning happening for the video itself so that when it's viewed back, all participants will or all viewers will be able to see that um, closed caption. If you need the services of the sign interpreters, um, you can pin their video. To pin their video, look in the upper right hand corner of your video and you'll see three dots. Click on that those three dots and you'll be able to see um, make a pin or pin a I don't know exactly what it says, but it will say something about pin to your screen or something like that. So you'll always be able to see the interpreter. For those um, that are using the services of an interpreter, if you want to please keep put your video on in just a moment so we can see who you are. For those um, that are not using the services of the interpreter, I would ask you to please turn your videos off. We'll ask you to keep your videos off the entire uh, portion unless it's at the Q&A time where we'll um, ask you to come on video if you're going to ask a question. Um, the, Q the question and answer is more about what you're hearing, not just Project 2025 in general, um, because it truly is... Um, 900 pages and too much to get through or to even delve into in a conversation like that. Um, but our speakers tonight, who will introduce themselves in just a moment, are Mark Weinberg and Tom Slater, who are two members of the D Democratic Central Committee. They are both attorneys. One will be talking about the Chevron deference and um, some other things in regards to the administrative state. And Tom Slater will be talking about the immunity, presidential immunity. And um, Mark will be weaving in the Project 2025 in relation to his presentations. Um, each presentation will be about 20 minutes, and then we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes worth of Q&A after the second presentation and that Q&A specifically for that. We'll open up the floor to anyone that has any questions that you may have thought about um, in general in relation to what you've heard. Tonight is literally just the tip of the iceberg in regards to this conversation. Yeah. Uh, we as a central committee look forward to having um, more than one of these conversations. What that looks like when that is is not known at the time, but we will certainly keep you informed um, by sending an email when we're ready to um, talk about the next step. Um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and turn my video off and Mark will be introducing himself. I'll come back on when he reaches uh, his uh, time limit or time max and uh, we'll open the floor for some questions. Okie dokie. Hello, I'm Mark Weinberg. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mary. Really, really nice of you to do this. Uh, I've been looking forward to this for quite some time because 2025 is an incredibly important document, and it really is the transition plan for the next Trump administration. Uh, so we need to take it seriously. And we know that Trump is already trying to beg off and say that, oh, he doesn't know anything about this, yet he disagrees with the number of the proposals. Well, how do you not know anything about it but disagree with the proposals? So it's another Trumpism. Uh, so what I plan to do here is talk about 2025 briefly, 
I want to lay a foundation for the discussion by just briefly, very briefly going over the art, two articles of the Constitution. And then I want to talk about the forward of 2025 and pick out some specific provisions to read to you. I know, I'm sorry, I'm reading it to you, but uh, like, like Mary said, it's a 900 page document. And there's no way ahead that we can cover it all. Uh, then I'm gonna go talk about section one, which is taking reins of the government. And then I'm gonna talk briefly about three very recent Supreme Court cases, which kneecap the administrative state. And by doing so, it's going to kneecap every protection that we rely on in this country. So this is really serious stuff. Uh, my background is uh, graduated from law school, 76. Um, I eventually spent nine years at the Securities Exchange Commission. Uh, I was a branch chief, uh, a staff attorney, a branch chief, and a special counsel. Uh, and then after that, I spent 17 years at the appraisal subcommittee of the Federal Financial Institutions Examination Council, better known as the ASC. It's a brand new agency as of 1989. I was its very first employee as general counsel, and it was born on the SNL crisis in the 80s. The agency basically regulates real estate appraisers throughout the country by overseeing state appraisal regulatory agencies and overseeing a private foundation which, which creates all the rules and regulations for appraisers throughout the country. Um, it was very challenging to do that. So in any event, let's move on, okay? Uh, so I'm using an article by Amber Phillips from the Washington Post. It's called, What is Project 2025? And I'm just gonna quickly go over this because it synopsizes it pretty well. I want to give you a, a little bit of caution. There is our documents on the internet which supposedly summarize this, but they're mixing apples and oranges. They're taking general, general Republican positions and injecting those into here and being, I'm sorry to say this, a bit propaganda. There's a bit propagandizing. So be careful what you read. Make sure that it is indeed factual. This article is short and it is factual. And I'm just gonna read this right off. I apologize for me reading this off. The centerpiece is a 900 page plan that calls for extreme policies on nearly every aspect of Americans' lives, from mass deportations to politicizing the federal government in a way that would give Trump control over the Justice Department, to cutting entire federal agencies, to infusing Christian nationalism into every facet of government policy, by calling for a ban on pornography and promoting policies that quote, encourage, that encourage quote, marriage, work, motherhood, fatherhood, and nuclear families. Again, this is not coming from the Trump campaign, but if you take a look at the people that wrote this, they are almost all related to the, they were Trump officers in the administration, or they're very highly, very well-known conservative activists. Um, Project 2025 calls for abortion limits, slashing climate change and LGBTQ healthcare and much more. First of all, and this is a real concern of mine, it wants to remake the federal workforce to be political, totally political, um, which means they can fire anybody they want to if you are not politically acceptable to them. You know, I'll talk about this more. Uh, they want to completely cut the education department. That's their goal. They want to take the education department's uh, uh, actions and move them into other departments. They want to do this with several other agencies and departments to split them all up. Um, so they want to eliminate that. They want to give Trump the power to investigate his opponents. And that's by moving the Justice Department and indeed every agency directly under the control of the president and his lackeys. Sorry, I'm using the word lackeys, but that's what they are. Um, this includes the FBI. They would, they, top to bottom, review the FBI and the Justice Department. If you think things were bad during the first Trump camp, uh, Trump administration, they got something else coming now. Um, they will make rep reproductive care, any kind of reproductive care, difficult to obtain. 
They want to, in particular, get rid of abortion pills, methoprestone. We'll talk about that a little bit later, too. Uh, and they want to lead the nation in restoring a culture of life again. Okay, They want to crack down on even legal immigration. They want to identify every single person who's not, who's not a, uh, who is an unquote, quote, illegal alien, lock them up and send them out. Get them rid of them. This even includes U.S. citizens who could be married to an undocumented uh, person. They would be removed also. American citizens. Uh, it would be draconian and something we haven't seen since we locked up the Japanese during World War II, which is a stain on us. And also, I'm sorry to go there, but Nazi Germany. Uh, it will completely kill climate change, totally, including getting rid of the National, blah, 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 National Oceanic and Atmosphere Administration, the people that bring you the weather. Now, right now, I'm taking flying lessons, and I am extremely dependent on what the weather is. It's all provided by this agency. They will kill it. They will absolutely kill it, and any kind of discussion about climate change coming out of there would be completely destroyed. It doesn't exist as far as they're concerned. Drill, baby, drill is their, their true words. That's, they want to do that. Transgender people will be cut out of the military. And there's even some discussion of reinstating the military draft. Those are the sort of main points of what they're doing. Um, how it will be implemented, I'm going to get into that. It's very frightening. Uh, now, before we get into anything, I want to very, very quickly go over a couple of provisions. Article 2 is for the executive. That's the president. And his main duties are, um, well, first of all, he, he swears the same oath that every civil servant does. I do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of whatever office it is, he's president, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. I've taken that oath, I think, three times in my life, and I always took it very seriously. The president's commander-in-chief, we all know that. He also is commander-in-chief of the militia in the several states, the National Guard, if they're called into operation. Um, he has the power to grant pardons, specifically. He has the power with the advice and consent of the Senate, which is very important to nominate um, ambassadors, other public ministers, and councils, judges of the Supreme Court, and all other officers in the United States. Uh, Congress may, by law, vest the appointment of such inferior offices in the president alone, the courts, or the heads of departments, so it can't be delegated. Uh, so that and he has a duty that he take care that all the laws be faithfully executed. So that's basic. It's very short. Now, Congress has many more powers and they're all delineated here. Um, to, the top ones are to regulate commerce between four nations and the several states. That's the Commerce Clause uh, to uh, ensure the general wealth for the United States to constitute tribunals inferior to the Supreme Court. Every court under the Supreme Court is under Congress's control. They can create them, they can, they can get rid of them. Um, declare war, to raise armies, to pay for armies, to the Navy, um, provide for calling forth the militia, so Congress does that, has that power. Uh, and to make all laws that are necessary and proper for carrying out into execution all the foregoing powers. That's the catch-all, and that's a very big, big uh, authority. Now, I want to go, since we talked about that a little bit, I want to go into what their forward says. This is specifically out of what they're doing, and I'm just going to talk about a few things here. Um, I would suggest that you actually read this forward. It's not long. And, uh, and study it because it's really important. There are four fronts, four main goals. Restore family as the center place of, center place of American life and protect our children. 
That means schools, folks. You know about those schools? Dismantle the administrative state and return self-government to the American people. Defend our nation's sovereignty, borders, bounty against global threats. That includes immigrants. Secure our God-given individual rights to live freely in what our Constitution calls the blessings of liberty. Later on, they equate the blessings of liberty to blessedness, which is very religious to me. Um, so keep that in mind. That's the main goals. The want to restore the family as a centerpiece of American life and protect our children. They say, today the life the left is threatening the taxes and status of churches and charities that reject woke progressivism. They will soon turn to Christian schools and clubs with the same totalitarian intent. Um, they want to delete every single term in every single government place, regulation, statute, anywhere, which talks about sexual orientation, gender identity, diversity, equity, inclusion, gender, gender equality, gender equity, gender awareness, gender sensitivity, abortion, rep reproductive health, reproductive rights, and any other term used to deprive Mer Americans of the First Amendment rights out of every federal rule, re agency regulation, contract grant regulation in place, a piece of legislation that exists. They want to make sure that pornography is outlawed and people be put in jail for that. And education or educate, educators in public library or librarians who purvey it should be classified as registered sex offenders and telecommunications companies, which is tele facilitate its spread, should be shuttered. Schools serve parents, not the other way around. Parents' rights as their pri children's primary educators should be non-negotiable in American schools, states, cities, counties, school boards, union bosses, principals, and teachers who disagree should be immediately cut off from federal funds. They do that all the way through this. Cut them off, cut them off, cut them off. And they also use technical aspects to weaken the administrative state. Noxious tenants such as critical race theory and gender ide ideology should be ex excised. Um, and I can go on and on and on. I'm looking for, oh, abortion. Finally, conservatives should gratefully celebrate the greatest pro-family the greatest pro-family win in a generation overturning Roe v. Wade. But Dobbs' decision is just the beginning. Conservatives throughout the country should push as hard as possible to, pr to protect the unborn in every jurisdiction in America. Most robust protections for the unborn that Congress will support and to use federal powers to protect innocent life in vigorously complying with statutory bans on federal funding of abortion. Alternative options should be explored, such as, such as uh, adoption. We're getting a flavor of what we're talking about. Um, the term administrative state refers to the policy-making work done by bureaucracies of all the federal governments, departments, agencies, and millions of employees. <clears throat> to do Congress passes intentionally vague laws so these agencies who are not elected or anything could go ahead and do it. Now there is in, in, in incredible bias against intellectualism, uh, in, uh, advanced degrees, anybody who's expert, they they think that the and they use the example, the the woman from Texas who has a kid, in football, uh, in, in a football league, that those are the people that the government should consider and that the uh, upper crust, the elites, which they call them, which includes me, by the way, um, uh, they cannot be trusted whatsoever. They'll just lie, cheat and steal and do whatever they can to enrich themselves and to not care about the people as a whole. It's absolutely crazy. Um, give you a, a little personal aside here. I spent 27 years in the government. I took that oath. I took it seriously. And by and large, like in every single large organization, there are always a few bad apples here and there. 
There are people that go to the library and sleep. You know, it's not right or take advantage of some regulations about sick leave and stuff like that. But by and large, 95 to 99 percent of the people who work for the government do it because they are dedicated to do so. And they all take an oath to the Constitution, not to a man, not to a policy, not to politics. In other words, even though we have political people that might be on a board, we don't care. We're going to give our best efforts balanced by our experience and our learning to provide the best information possible for the decision makers. I'll talk about regulation a little bit uh, because people don't understand regulation. Regulation is not a bad thing. Congress eventually decides, finds out that there's a real problem, a real problem, and has to go ahead and solve it. What does it do? It creates legislation. It, it authorizes an agency to spell out what the details are. The agency people do their very best to do that. They go through a notice and comment period on the rules and regulations, always keeping in mind Congress's goals. We don't do anything that is extended, that, that is too much. If we do something that's extended, someone can complain, it can go to court, and the court can overturn it. Turn it. Um, Almost every single agency has this authority. And if we stop to regulate, then we stop solving our issues and protecting our population. And that is what they want. They want everybody to be on their own and decide for themselves what is best for the country and best for them. Um, Congress doesn't, Congress is not really appreciated. Uh, and uh, it's it's just very frightening. Now, I only got a couple of minutes left here, so I'm just going to speed along here. Um, please read that forward. It's going to make your hair stand on him. Taking the reins of government, what they plan to do, and they're already doing this now, they are creating a, an entire list of people who want to be in the administration, who will pass the political test of supporting Trump and his policies, and they will become the cadre of every single agency and department in the entire country. They are intending to fill every slot with political appointees, which will have the last say, the last say in anything that agency does. Does anybody remember the hunt for uh, uh, the hunt for Red October? That movie. There was a political officer on board of that submarine. Everything that the captain did had to go through the political guy, and it caused a real problem. And if I recall, the political guy ended up not doing very well in the end because of the captain's actions. But that's what they want to do. They want to control the entire government, and they want to fire. Every single civil servant that does not comply with the leader's wishes. I'm not kidding you. That is Adolf Hitler. That is Mao Zedong. That is, every, that is what's going on in North Korea. That is going on in every single state that does not have a democracy. So that's what we're facing here. Mass firings of Every civil servant who is not a political animal. The only people that'll stay are the people that are indeed in agreement with his policies or are willing to carry out his policies. Little story, I have a very close friend during the Reagan years. He was at HUD and he did housing stuff, obviously. And his program was frowned upon by the political people that were in HUD. And he spent over a year in a closet doing nothing because his program did not satisfy what the political people were doing. He read books. That's what we're up against. That's what they're going to do nationwide, government-wide. I mean, if I were you, I would be extremely frightened. I only got a couple of minutes. I'm, actually, I got 20 minutes already. I was going to cover three basic cases here, too. These are all cases that came down from the Supreme Court at the end of June, ending July 1st, between June 28th and July 1st. And what they did was kneecap the 
administrative stage. It shows complete disregard for expertise in the administrative state. It, it shows complete disregard for the process that has been in, in, has been established for decades now, for decades. They have completely overturned precedent willy-nilly in the strangest ways possible. Um, I, I don't have the, I, I analyze these like I would in law school and obviously I'm not gonna do the, that here, but suffice it to say that Jarchese, SEC versus Jarchese, completely destroyed the ability for the SEC to do in-house adjudications for fraud. They have to go to court now. They have to go to court. They can't choose to do it in-house. That will profoundly affect every other agency in the country that deals with fraud. Um, and of course, fraud is a term which is very abstract. How do you define fraud? Well, that's what the agencies do. Courts can do that, but it's not the best place to do it first. Uh, then they did um, Loper Bright Enterprises versus Petitioners. That killed off the, the presumption of acceptance of agency action in Chevron, which was a very important case from 1984. I used it all the time as general counsel. And what that basically says is if the agency is doing its job and somebody appeals the agency action, the court must take the agency's action and accept it, its interpretations, as valid unless it is uh, arbitrary, capricious, or inconsistent with law, or if the facts are not supported by the record. That's what, that's what the statutes say. Everybody used that to say, oh, well, we can do what we need to do as long as it's logical. We do all of our homework and we present it to the public at large. We take all the comments in, we balance all the interests, we do the best we can, and then we publish the regulation for comment, we get comments back, we, then we do the regulation in the final. This says we can't do that anymore. So it says every single case can be questioned by a court, no matter what it is. Let's talk about courts for a second. In a couple of cases, I'll just give you examples. You might remember Kazmierik, Judge Kazmierik. He's in Texas. He's a district court judge. He found nationwide that mefeprestone, which was had been approved 20 years ago, is not safe, and that the that what the agency did back then, 20 years ago, was wrong. Um, and then there's another case called Corner Post, where they took a statutory provision, a statute of limitations, and said it doesn't exist anymore. So when you adopt a regulation, or if a statute is created, there's six years under the law to, to uh, address that statute, to facially uh, uh, um, go after it. Well, guess what? The Supreme Court said, that doesn't stand. In these cases, if somebody gets an injury 30 years after that, in other words, in 1934, the Supreme, the SEC adopted the Securities Exchange Act in 1934. That means today, if somebody gets into the market and they decide that that statute no longer is valid for whatever reason, they can still bring suit, even though that six-year period has been long gone, long gone. So we're talking about an influx of court cases and we're talking about court throwing it into courts that do not have the expertise to handle a lot of this stuff because it's extremely complicated. Um, Mark, I'm going to ask you to please okay. wrap it up in the next minute so we can That's it. go to Q&A. I was going to just go over a couple of things about Congress. Congress usually gives statutes, enabling statutes, which are fairly broad because it can't cover everything. In other words, fraud. Fraud, what is fraud? Well, the SEC has got to define fraud. Most agencies have to define fraud. Fraud is, a, is an animal which changes. And usually the criminals keep ahead of whatever the agencies are doing. So it's very vague. This says it's got to be in court. It can't be in the agency. They can't define it. Uh, 
And this holds for my old agency too. It's got the same problem. Every single agency, I'm so glad I'm out of the government because I wouldn't know what to do anymore. I literally wouldn't know because everything's up for grabs now. And that means the conservatives can go after every single government program and do whatever they want to it in court. And if they find the right court, and remember that court case about the documents in Florida, they can get what they want. So this is really careful. We need to have the Senate. We need to vote. If we don't control the Senate, we don't have anything. We will lose the courts. We already did lose the court, the court, because we did not keep our, our eyes on the ball. We must do our job and vote. And that's my, my part of the, this presentation. 26 minutes, sorry. Any questions? I hope I didn't get too technical. I tried not to. Uh, wasn't Chevron basically um, saying, I mean, when they overturned it, it it took the power away from the agencies, the expert agencies, and you know, it took the power away from traditionally the agencies which have experts in them, you know, made decisions. Isn't yes. that the basis of to overturn when they overturned Chevron, it took that power away and put it back to Congress, who has no expertise at all. They didn't put That's it back to Congress, they put it into the court system. Of course. And the court uh, system has no expertise either. No, so. the court system has no expertise. And as you very well know, courts court cases take forever. They're extremely expensive. In the in an administrative proceeding like the SEC proceeding, Jarkazi, it was clear these guys committed securities fraud. It was absolutely clear. There was no point. The SEC could have gone to court to do it, but there was no real issue. So they found it, it, it found for against Jarkazi a $300,000 fine, uh, and uh, the court, based, the Supreme Court said, uh, this is like common law fraud, and common law fraud back in 1750 was handled in the English, English courts in a court of law, and that's where it belongs, where there's a jury. There's a jury. We cannot have a case without a jury, and in, when you have an administrative case, it's not a jury. It's an administrative law judge that finds it. And um, they don't trust those whatsoever. Absolutely. They don't trust the administrative state at all. Did that help, Jan? The deference is gone. There is no more deference. An agency thank, just thank like you, Mark. anybody else. Thank You're you, Mark. Welcome. We have a question in chat from Brigida, uh, who says, is Mark saying that the Project 2025 proposes no regulatory process by federal agencies after the Congress passes laws and allow states, state politicians to interpret and the staffers who disagree with them would be easily fired. Did I follow that correctly? No, no. It does not say that the agencies will not create regulations. What it's saying is they're going to reduce a lot what the regulatory state can do by changing statutes, changing departments, changing procedures. And, and not only that, um, they want to turn back a lot of the a lot of the governing to the states because that's supposedly where the people is. Now, I disagree with that completely because the government is the people. I've been in the government. We're the same thing. You know, it reflects the whole population. Um, so I don't agree with that. There's no difference between the government, which everybody can stand on the conservative side, and us, who we believe the government can do good and we can work for the, the benefits of the people. So they want to turn it back to the states as much as possible, just like they did with abortion, just like they did with abortion. And they want also to cripple the agencies so that the only policies and regulations that come out of the agencies are those that comport with basically Christian nationalism, doing all the things that I, I just talked about, just cleansing the entire system of any appreciation for differences in the country. They want to, they want to make sure that that lady in Texas 
uh, is the only person that they care about. Well, we care about those people too as progressives. So it doesn't make any sense. They think we're evil. So be it. Okay, we have two other questions. And then uh, we have one in chat, one with their hand up. And then we're going to go to the next presentation. And then we'll hold the other questions until after that. So the next question in chat, and then Sharon, I'll get to you. How does Project 2025 define pornography? Ah, ah, it doesn't. Uh, there's an old quote back in the day uh, when there was a discussion of pornography by the Supreme Court. I think it was Justice Jackson. He said, I know, porno I, por I know por pornography when I see it. And that's pretty much what it is. They don't know what pornography, pornography is. They didn't define it, but they want to send everybody to jail who does it. Uh, they want to, um, they view LGBTQ to be pornography pretty much. They, they, if it doesn't comport with a man and a woman in Christian marriage, it doesn't mean anything to them. They want okay. all of that away. Okay. Sharon, ask your question and then we're going to go to Tom and Marianne has a question in chat that we'll save to the uh, end. Go ahead, Sharon. Sharon, are you there? Oh, there she goes. Hi. Um, my question is, how can a multinational corporation work if every state has different regulations? Usually, uh -huh. it's the federal government has you know supersedes all state reg regulations. How will this work? It's called a patchwork. We're going back to the states again. Uh, a lot of this stuff is. I'm sorry to say this, but it goes back to the Civil War and Reconstruction. It goes back to states' rights. So much of the states' rights, they want to take away the power of the federal government and go back to the, where it was before the New Deal, where there weren't many agencies and there wasn't much regulation. Everybody was kind of on their own. That's what they want to do. And if it's, if people suffer because of that, or if there's a patch quilt of regulation and laws, so be it. What do we got today for abortion? That's what they want. Every state's different. Every state it's reflects its every state is different, and every state reflects its population. That's what they believe. It's closer to the people, quote unquote. The federal government isn't. All right. Thank you, um, Mark, for your presentation and the q and I'm, I'm going to give you Marianne's question so that you can think about it. So that when we come back to the Q&A, you'll be able to address that. But her question is, uh, I think she's saying the information is Wheaties or, or like um, not Wheaties. It's very weedy. Um, what can we what kind of message can we give the voter? So think about that so that I, I, I know the answer. Okay, great. But let's wait until okay. the end because we want to get Tom's presentation in. Gotcha. So, all right, Tom, the floor is yours for the next 20 minutes to talk about immunity. Well, if Mark scared you to death, I <laughs> wish I could tell you that the Supreme Court is here to have your back, but uh, I'm afraid I, I can't say that. Uh, and in terms of being in the weeds, I'm going to get in the weeds a little um, bit. I'm going to talk about the, uh, the Supreme Court case uh, that. Uh, Hello. That deals with presidential immunity. Somebody talking there? Yeah, um, but I'm muting them. Okay. Uh, first of all, um, a little bit about my background. Uh, I've been involved in politics for 60 years, and uh, I used to uh, teach school. I taught high school, and I taught Frederick Community College for about 20 years. I mostly taught U.S. history and uh, state and local government, uh, and and I'm an attorney also like Mark. Uh, I, I'm not a, an expert on constitutional law. Uh, I dealt more with child abuse and neglect and disability, but I have read all 119 pages of Trump versus USA, and the uh, screen just changed. Can you all see me and hear me? Oh, there we go. Uh, and uh, so um, I, I wanna tell you about the posture of that case. Uh, a federal grand jury indicted Trump on four counts. Uh, 
Uh, Trump moved to dismiss it, citing absolute presidential immunity. It went to the trial court. The trial court had a hearing on that issue, uh, denied Trump's uh, motion to dismiss. Uh, and then it went to the uh, D.C. Circuit Court, and they affirmed the district court's decision, saying that there is no presidential immunity. And then the Supreme Court granted cert. Cert means they allowed the case to be brought to the Supreme Court. It was a six to three decision. I'm going to first discuss the majority's holding uh, and then the two concurring opinions and the two dissenting opinions. And uh, no, Marianne, I don't have any message to the voter. I just want to help you uh, be informed about what this decision is all about. Uh, as Mark said, there's nothing in the Constitution that speaks to the issue of whether the president is entitled to immunity. In fact, the only immunity that's discussed in the Constitution is the immunity, the, the speech immunity that Congress has, that they're immune from prosecution uh, for any speech they give uh, as, or any talking they do on the floor of Congress, uh, which, which is a good indication that the founders, when they wrote the Constitution, knew what immunity was. If they thought they should have given the president immunity, they would have done it, and they didn't. Um, the court, uh, the decision written by Chief Justice uh, Roberts relies on five Supreme Court decisions on, uh, and tries to extrapolate from these previous decisions uh, a framework for deciding immunity. The first one is the Youngstown Sheet and, Sheet and Tube versus Sawyer. And in that case, the Supreme Court decided that the president, President Truman, overstepped his bounds when he issued an executive order to seize the steel mills. The, the most important decision they relied on was the 1982 decision, Nixon versus Fitzgerald, which is a civil case where there was a civil servant who was fired and he sued Richard Nixon because he claimed that Richard Nixon ordered him to be fired. Uh, and it was a civil case. And in that case, the Supreme Court determined that the president did have immunity, had absolute immunity for civil damage claims. Uh, that stem from the president exercising his powers as president. That was a five to four decision uh, with uh, Justice Powell writing the decision joined by Chief Justice Berger and Justices Rehnquist, Stevens, and O'Connor with the dissent by White joined by Blackman, Brennan, and Marshall. So it was not a, uh, it was a very closely decided decision, the decision that said that the president does have immunity for civil damage claims. And then the other uh, three cases that they relied on were Clinton versus Jones, which is another civil case where Jones sued Clinton uh, for acts that he did before he became president uh, that uh, she called abhorrent sexual advances towards her. The, the, the uh, Supreme Court held that the president is subject to the same laws that apply to all citizens for private unofficial acts that occurred uh, before he was president. And it was a unanimous decision. All the all the uh, uh, justices agreed. The only one that, well, he was he he joined the opinion, but Justice Breyer just says an interesting thing. Who who was a liberal justice uh, thought that the Clinton uh, thought that um, um, they went a little. They should have given some immunity in that case. The other two decisions I'll do real quick were Trump versus Hawaii and Trump versus Vance. Vance, Trump versus Hawaii was a Muslim ban, which she was supported in a five to four decision. And in Vance, seven justices agreed in, in Trump versus Vance. And that had to do with uh, a subpoena to get his records in a criminal case. This is, this is the only really criminal case that was involved in the precedent that uh, Roberts relied on. And in that case, um, in that case uh, Vance, uh, who was the Bragg's predecessor as the uh, state's attorney in Manhattan, uh, Bragg subpoenaed Trump's records, financial records, and the court said that there is no absolute immunity from the issuance of a state criminal subpoena. It was a seven to two decision. Thomas and Alito, as you might imagine, uh, were the ones who dissented in that opinion. So Roberts set out in his opinion to try to draft a framework for dealing with immunity. And in every case, he went as far as you could go to give 
the benefit of the doubt to the president having immunity, using these precedents that I just talked about. The basic holding is that the president has absolute immunity from criminal prosecution, criminal prosecution for conduct within his exclusive fear of, sphere of constitutional authority. In other words, if the president is doing things that the president does, like giving pardons, for example, exclusively the power of the president, he has absolute immunity in, in all of the actions associated with that. And then he said there's a presumption of immunity from criminal prosecution for a president's acts that were what he called within the outer perimeter of his official responsibility. In other words, if it's close, he's still got a presumption of immunity. The presumption can be overcome. He doesn't really explain. Well, he does say the presumption can be overcome only if the government must show that applying a criminal prohibition of that act would pose, this is a quote, no dangers of intrusion on the authority of the executive branch. Uh, he uses Nixon versus Fitzgerald as the basis for that conclusion. And as I said earlier, Nixon versus Fitzgerald is a civil case, or was a civil case. This is a criminal case. And then finally, as for the president's unofficial acts, there's no immunity. That's the same decision as uh, Jones, uh, Clinton versus Jones. There's no immunity. But he throws in a kicker. He says, if you're dividing official or deciding official from unofficial conduct, courts may not inquire uh, into the president's motives such as, uh, as such a highly intrusive inquiry would risk it exposing even the most obvious instances of official conduct to judicial examination on the mere allegation of improper purpose. So you can't look at the president's motive. So the president decides to give a pardon to somebody. He gets a he's offered a million dollar bribe. He uh, tells the attorney general. He talks to the attorney general about it. You can't subpoena the attorney general to come and say what the president said of what his motive was, uh, because that would be prohibited under this decision. Uh, so, uh, looking at a couple of the accusations against. Trump in this uh, criminal case, uh, Trump is absolutely immune from prosecution for any alleged conduct involving discussions with Justice Department officials. When he talked with that acting attorney general and talked to him about what to do to try to uh, steal the election or to prop up uh, electors that were not do, do, uh, dutiful, dutifully selected, that's, that evidence cannot be used. Trump's alleged attempts to influence the vice president's oversight and certification proceeding is within the outer parameter of his official responsibility, and therefore the state has the burden of rebutting the presumption of immunity. In other words, the vice president's actions uh, have to do with presiding over the Senate and the counting of the electoral votes, and that's not an exclusive responsibility of the president uh, of the executive excuse me, of the executive branch, but it is within that outer perimeter, so there's a presumption that it, that he has immunity. And so that ha to, to prosecute him on that, the prosecutor is going to have to overcome that presumption. And in regard to the allegations that he engaged in various activities uh, around January 6th and was involved in contacting state officials to try to, to not certify the election, those actions also according to Roberts, are within the, out, within the outer perimeter of his official conduct. And the lower court has to determine whether that conduct is official or unofficial. But here's the second kicker. Testimony of private records of the president or his advisors probing such conduct may not be admitted as evidence in the trial. So Roberts, in every, at every step, went overboard and giving additional protections to a president, this president, this past president, President Trump. Now there were two concurring opinions. One, Justice Thomas, he didn't really, I mean, he agreed with Roberts, but then he said, like uh, the, the judge in Florida uh, said the other day uh, that the special counsel is illegal. 
And so he would have dismissed the whole case as a special counsel is illegal. Justice Barrett concurred in the opinion, except for part 3C, and that's the part that prohibited the testimony using private records of the president or his advisor. Uh, she's, she disagreed with that. And she said she saw no plausible argument that the president's attempt to influence how states select their electors is prohibited by presidential immunity, as those actions are clearly not within the duties of the president. But she was just one justice. The, the five that uh, agreed with the decision uh, of Roberts uh, don't agree with uh, the other four don't don't agree with her. So um, or actually it was six to three. Uh, so um, we, we have to commend her for at least not falling totally in line. Uh, so she agreed with that. So what happens next? The whole case has to go back to the trial court. Then the trial court has to take these principles that uh, Roberts outlined and look at the indictment and determine which actions are immune from prosecution and which are not. What will happen is the special prosecutor will probably um, mend the indictment to include, I mean, to eliminate a lot of things which are clearly not going to be uh, able to be proven. I mean, he's going to have to narrow down the indictment, and then the trial court's going to have to have a hearing on all of the evidence to determine, or all of the alleged acts to determine which are, which is he immune from, uh, which are in the outer parameters of his uh, of, of his uh, actions and whether he has immunity or not, whether the state can overcome the presumptions or not. So this case is not going away. It's going to come back to the Supreme Court once the lower court and the appellate court, uh, make, once they make decisions about these uh, these acts that, we, that the special prosecutor alleges that uh, Trump engaged in, Whatever decision the trial court makes and the appellate court to make, it's obviously going to go to the Supreme Court and they're going to have another whack at it and maybe make it even less so that a president can be prosecuted. Uh, one of the things that stands out about this case is the vitriolic language in that case. And Mary, if you could share the screen, rather than uh, me uh, try to explain it, uh, Justice Sotomayor filed a, a dissent joined by Justices Kagan and Jackson. And I just want to show you that, remember that these nine justices, I just read this the other day, these nine justices, when they're in Washington, when they're at the Supreme Court, which is not every day, but a good portion of the time, they have lunch every day together. They sit at a table, they have assigned seats, and they have lunch. And Mary, can you, can you share that screen? If not, I, I have a copy of it, but... Um, I was... I'm going to share it. I don't know if it's going to block the interpreter or not. I it probably shouldn't, but um, no, Mr. Interpreter, I was going to say, Mr. Interpreter, you have to let me know. But okay, yeah. I will share the screen now. Okay, and my eyesight is so bad. I uh, usually wear a different pair of glasses when I'm looking at the screen, so I may have to read off of my own. But this is from Justice uh, St uh, Sotomayor. She said, today's decision to grant former presidents criminal immunity reshapes the institution of the presidency. It makes a mockery of the principle foundational to our constitution and system of government that no man is above the law, relying on little more than its own misguided wisdom about the need for bold and unhesitating action by the president. The court gives former President Trump all the immunity he asked for and more. Because our Constitution does not shield a former president from answering for criminal and treasonous acts by dissent. And then the, she says, the court now confronts a question has never had to answer in the nation's history, whether a former president enjoys immunity for federal criminal prosecution. The majority thinks he should. And so it invents an atextual, ahistorical, and unjustifiable immunity that puts the president above the law. The majority makes three moves and in effect completely insulate presidents from criminal liability. This holding is unnecessary on the facts of the indictment and the majority's attempt to apply it to the facts expands the concepts of core power beyond any reasonable bounds. Now this is language that you don't see in Supreme Court decisions uh, that, is it, that are, the language is so powerful. Whether described as a presumption or absolute under the majority's rule, 
president's use of any official power for any person's purpose, even the most corrupt, is immune from prosecution. That is just as bad as it sounds, and it is baseless. Finally, the majority declares that evidence concerning acts for which the president is immune can play no role in any criminal prosecution against it. That holding, which will prevent the government from using a president's official acts to prove knowledge or intent in prosecuting private offenses, is nonsensical. Argument by argument, the majority invents immunity through brute force. Under scrutiny, its arguments crumble. The main takeaway of today's decision is that all of a president's official acts, defined without regard to motive or intent, are entitled to immunity, that is, at least presumptive and quite possibly absolute. This official acts immunity has no firm grounding in constitutional text, history, or precedent. Indeed, no standard grounds for constitutional decision-making all point in the opposite direction. No matter how you look at it, the majority's official acts immunity is utterly indefensible. The majority calls for a careful assessment of the scope of presidential power under the Constitution. For the majority, that careful assessment, move it up a little, Mary, does not involve the Constitution's text. I would start there. The Constitution's text contains no provision for immunity from criminal prosecution for former presidents. Nothing in our history, however, supports the majority's entirely novel immunity from criminal prosecution for official acts. This historical evidence reinforces that from the very beginning, the presumption in this nation has always been that no man is free to flout the criminal law. The majority fails to recognize or grapple with the lack of historical evidence for its new immunity. With nothing on its side of the ledger, the most the majority can do is claim that the historical evidence is a wash. A little bit more, just about finished. In sum, the majority today endorses an expansive version, vision of presidential immunity that was never recognized by the founders, any sitting president, the executive branch, or even President Trump's lawyers until now. Settled understanding of the Constitution are of little use to the majority if the, in this case, and so it ignores them. Today's court, however, has replaced the presumption of equity before the law with the presumption that the president is above the law for all his official acts. In fact, the majority's dividing line between official and unofficial conduct narrows the conduct considered unofficial almost to a nullity. The majority's bare assertion and the burden of exposure to federal criminal prosecution is more limiting to a president than the burden of exposure to civil suits does not make it true, and it is not persuaded. Poison it is a far greater danger if the president feels empowered to violate federal criminal law, buoyed by the knowledge of future immunity. I'm deeply troubled by, by the idea, inherent in the majority's opinion, that our nation loses something valuable when the president is forced to operate within the confines of federal criminal law. The majority tries to assuage any concerns about its made up for immunity by suggesting that the government agrees with it. That's, that suggestion will surprise the government. The majority's extraordinary rule has no basis in law. Whatever that suggestion is supposed to accomplish it does not salvage the majority's nonsensical evidential rule. In reaching out to shield some conduct as official, while refusing to recognize any conduct as unofficial, the majority engages in judicial activism, not judicial restraint. If the majority's sweeping conception of official acts has any real limits, the majority is unwilling to reveal them in today's decision. Looking beyond the fate of this particular prosecution, the long-term consequences of today's decision are stark. The court effectively creates a law-free zone around the president upsetting the status quo that has existed since the founding. This new official acts immunity now lies about like a loaded weapon for any president who wishes to place his own interests, his own political side, survival, or his own financial gain above the interests of the nation. The president in the, of the United States is the most powerful person in the country and possibly the world. When he uses his official powers in any way under the majority's reasoning, he now will be insulated from criminal prosecution. Orders the Navy SEAL 6 to assassinate the political rival, immune. Organizes a military coup to hold him to power, immune. Takes a bribe in exchange for a pardon, immune, 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 immune. Never in the history of our republic, as a president had reason to believe that he would be immune from criminal prosecution, 
if he used the trappings of his office to violate the criminal law. Moving forward, however, all former presidents will be cloaked in such immunity if the occupant of that office misuses official power for personal gain. The criminal law that the rest of us must abide will not provide a backstop. Fear for our democracy, I dissent. Now, that's not a powerful dissent. I've never heard that will go down in history as um, one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful dissent ever in the Supreme Court. Now, when Roberts read that dissent, then he spoke to the dissents. And, and I'm not going to read over because you've heard me read too long and I'm very thirsty right now. But this, I, I, you can read it for yourself. This is what Roberts said in his ma majority opinion about the dissent. Talks about chilling doom, wholly disproportionate to what actually happens today. They have no meaningful textual or historical support. Uh, and he, go he goes on to say uh, that uh, rhetorically chilling is wholly unjustified. The, it, it, it just, uh, he says the Constitution, the, the centers ignore the separation of powers uh, and move it up, Mary. Um, and so he he hits back, uh, but but the bottom line is that this is uh, this is uh, a powerful powerful dissent, and um, I think uh, when um, when all is said and done, this Supreme Court decision, especially as it is reinterpreted when the case comes back up, and believe me, it won't get better, uh, is going to go down uh, with. Plessy versus Ferguson and uh, uh, the is it the Dobbs decision and and I have, I had a list of them here. Uh, uh, Red Scott, Coromazzo versus USA, Dred Scott, uh, Gore versus Gore, uh, and, and Shelby County versus Holton, uh, and, and this Looper Bright Enterprises, which was a Chevron decision. This decision is going to go down in history. Uh, uh, with uh, with a cloak of shame on the Supreme Court of the United States. Yeah. I Thank think you. actually it is the worst decision ever made because it cuts to the very foundation of our entire democracy. Thank you. I'm done. Okay. Thank you, um, Tom. Does anybody have any questions for Tom? Melanie, I see your question in chat. I think Tom kind of dabbled into it a little bit without knowing your question was there. But Tom, Melanie's question, um, in the future with a different SCOTUS, will the immunity decision be able to be overturned or is it permanent? Well, it depends on future courts are as loose with precedent as this court is. I mean, this, this court just ignores precedent. And so, you know, it's going to throw everything up. I, I mean, we'll see. Uh, hopefully at some point we'll get a Supreme Court that cares about the law and cares about precedent and and dumps this stupid idea of originalism and literalism and all that crap. Uh, I mean, this is just a really terrible decision. Yeah, But Tom, in order for it to be overturned, does something related to presidential immunity have to come before it? In other words, does some president oh, sure. have to violate sure. something? So if some, if, if no president can ever be charged because it's such an expansive view. How, I mean, how could it even well, get before them that a different court might have an opportunity to overturn it? Well, it's easy. The pros a prosecutor somewhere would indict the president. It's horrible to say that because in the whole history of the country, we've never had a president indicted. And that's that's why um, it's, 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 Richard Nixon accepted a pardon President Ford pardoned Nixon. When you accept the pardon, you acknowledge that you might that you did something criminal. And every president of the United States up until Donald Trump felt like they could not, there's a boundary. You cannot step over the line of criminal behavior. And this Supreme Court decision gives presidents the option, the opportunity to step over that bound. And Maybe one will do it, and maybe a prosecutor will prosecute them, and they'll go to the trial court, and the trial court uh, 
uh, with arguments from the defense attorney for the president will say, well, you have absolute immunity according to U.S. versus uh, Trump. And then that'll get appealed up. And then an, another Supreme Court will grant certiorari and reevaluate the whole issue of presidential immunity. I mean, that's what happened with Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896. Plessy versus Ferguson said that separate but equal is okay in streetcars in Louisiana. And that was the law until 1954. That was the Supreme Court decision. And then in the bound cases, two students in, uh, in Topeka, Kansas, two African-American students went to white schools to be enrolled and they wouldn't enroll them. And they sued and the lower court said, well, Plessy versus Ferguson, you got your schools. You don't have to go to a white school. And the court, uh, I, I don't know what the trial court decided in that case, but I assume the trial court said Plessy versus Ferguson is the Supreme Court. It got all the way up to the Supreme Court. And in 1954, the Supreme Court overruled Plessy versus Ferguson. So it is possible this decision will be overruled, but not with these just, and not when it comes back the next time around on this particular case, because it is, it's going to come back. The trial court's going to make a decision and whatever that decision is, it's going to be appealed and it'll come back to the Supreme Court and they'll narrow uh, or more fully uh, explain the the parameters of presidential immunity. And, and what's, what's terrible about this is all, all the, the quotes of language about presidential immunity that are used in this case are from most of the significant ones are from a civil case involving uh, Nixon, not a criminal case. And so it's uh, it, it, it just is uh, magical writing on the part of Judge Rob. Um, Daryl, Cindy, I see your comment. I'll talk about that in just a moment. Daryl, um, go ahead. Got you. You're, you're muted. Hit, you're muted, Daryl. There you go. I assume that uh, the reason that the two speakers were brought together this evening was to also communicate that the two issues are linked. So, in order for Project 2025 to go through, President Trump, if he is victorious, has to have the ability to violate some of the laws in order to push those initiatives through. So the court had to have that in place before he was presumed elected president. So I wouldn't be surprised that all of these discussions have already been had behind closed doors for this new uh, plan that they have for our country and putting the pieces in place. Uh, we have to be smart about this. This election is probably the most important election in our lifetime. We have to get people to the polls. We have to call everybody with blood that believes in the democratic way of life to get to the polls and to vote to make sure that we don't put this guy in the presidential office. Because if he does, he's been given the magic wand by the Supreme Court to do as much damage as he wants based on a plan that all of his cronies put together that he says he knows nothing about. We have to be smart about this. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the, the, the message, Marianne, is, uh, and I know you don't have to be told this message, is uh, get out there and fight, fight, fight. Uh, this this election is just so important in these, these cases in the Project 20, uh, 2025 this show what what we're looking at do we have any other questions for tom in regards to immunity before we open up the floor to general questions i lost my chat let me go back to chat um i have, Janie. I have one mary okay okay um let me find where it is um Janie, do you want me to ask or do you want to ask? I don't mind asking. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas, for all of that. Uh, my question was just in regards to 
typically the thinking around with Supreme Court muddling around with these sorts of things is that Congress needs to also then come back and pass legislation to either clarify or nullify um, some of these rulings. And I wasn't sure what your thoughts were on what you would suggest they should be doing and thinking about in terms of that first 100 days, assuming we can get uh, Kamala in there and everybody else that we need to get into Congress and keep it blue. I, I hadn't thought that about that, but yeah, I, I don't know why. Uh, Mark may have a different answer, but I don't know why the Congress couldn't pass a Presidential Immunity Act and spell out in more detail of uh, the amateur's presidential immunity. I don't know. I, I, think I, they, I thought that through. I think they could do that, but you also run the risk of the Supreme Court saying, hey, Congress, that's unconstitutional. Well, the, as I pointed out, there's nothing in the uh, Constitution that they base their decision on, except the separation of powers. I mean, it, I, I thought the argument that Trump made on the stump about this was nonsensical when he said that this would tie any kind of limitation on the president's ability to act would tie his hands up and he wouldn't be able, or, or she wouldn't be able, to be using the she word now, she wouldn't be able to uh, function if there were limits on what the president could do. Uh, but then you go back and look at the the case that you said that used that very same argument, the the uh, uh, which one was it? The Nixon case, uh, the Nixon versus Jackson. I think it was. It was, was they used that logic. They said a president can't have his time taken up by worrying about little suits here and there, and he has immunity for his official acts. But this doesn't even, but, but in the Constitution, it, what about in, in impeachment and being held? Well, no, it says, it says that the one remedy yeah. is impeachment. And, and being impeachment held. Clause and being talks held. about criminal prosecution. Exactly. So it's it doesn't, it's not consistent with the Constitution at all. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. The other thing I wanted to talk about a little bit is that the Supreme Court is intellectually un unsound. Sometimes they'll go back to the historical evidence to make sure that the, today's world will be affected by what happened in 1750. Um, and in this case, they didn't do any of that. I mean, it, nothing, nothing. My first question as a judge would be, why do you need this now? Every president has operated under criminal liability. Why do you need to upset the apple cart now? There doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. There's no need, except for a president that violates the law all the time, which we've had. Um, we have some questions in chat. Um, one, one thing I didn't realize in reading one of the cases is that uh, Thomas Jefferson advocated for complete immunity, criminal and civil. He believed that. Now, Marshall, in a case that Aaron Burr mm -hmm. got him down on that issue. Uh, but, but Jefferson believed there should be complete immunity. And there's some argument that uh, conservative scholars, well, conservative writers make, that the problem is that the Justice Department overcharged Trump and pushed this and that pushed the Supreme Court to, to make its irrational decision it did. I don't agree with that, but that's what some conservative writers are saying, that if Garland hadn't authorized the charges, the, degree, you know, the specificity and the degree that, he, that Trump was charged, then the Supreme Court might have uh, not gone as far as it did. That's, that's an argument. All right, I'm going to ask one question in chat and then we'll go to Melanie and Rachel. Um, the question in chat, uh, if Dems retake the House and keep the Senate, uh, won't that keep Trump if elected limited, I'm thinking they're trying to say? You know, uh, I, I don't have any confidence that this Supreme Court will do anything to tie the hands or... or I won't say that they will do. They they might do something, but but uh, you know, the, the, if Trump were to shoot somebody or something, I mean, I guess that would shock 
conscience of even the Supreme Court. Uh, but if you follow it to its logical conclusion, um, he he can get away with with murder, uh, literally and figuratively. Uh, so, and I don't think the Congress can do much about it. Remember, remember how I talked about the presidential powers. We're talking about those core powers. The army, he has complete control over the army. He can do anything he wants to, notwithstanding existing law. He could literally order our army to shoot and kill peaceful prote protesters with impunity. Or, or immigrants. I mean, look at that. He, could, he could order the army to go down to the border and set up machine gun uh, along the border and anybody come across, kill them. And that's within his official act as right. commander in chief. Under this interpretation, it'd be hard to say that he wouldn't be immune from prosecution for doing that. Okay, um, Melanie and then Rachel. I had seen on one of the talking heads shows that one of the attorneys indicated that this immunity decision only applies to Trump and maybe some other presidents down the line, and it does not apply to President Biden. Had no. you heard that, Tom? And do you know what they're no, referring no, to? Is it because no, Biden's not yet a, a former president? Or or what, what was that being referred to? I, I don't know. It, 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 the, the decision is a decision specific to the charges against Trump and Trump's case. But, but the general principles outlined by Roberts about the degree and the breadth of presidential immunity would apply to any president. And so, you know, it's the court, the lower court, trial court, appellate courts have to apply what the Supreme Court says about the limits of presidential immunity to the degree that there are limits. And so it would apply to any president uh, now and in the future, unless there was a change. I mean, unless there was a, another case involving presidential immunity that got the Supreme Court. And as I say, this case will get back to the spring, I, I believe, I firmly believe. Rachel? Hi. Um, you know, when this decision came down a few weeks ago, I was watching a liberal network and they had a, an attorney on um, who, you know, said basically what we're saying here. The Supreme Court went way too far. They have allowed Trump to have immunity and it can be very dangerous. But he also said that, you know, there was a case during Obama where he um, killed an American citizen overseas. And um, with this, with, with a decision like this, someone like Obama could not be prosecuted. A normal president who does things that may be good for the country, but could be controversial, cannot be prosecuted because of this ruling. What do you say to that? Well, he could, if the president, like uh, on the, uh, uh, i try to think of an example, when they get, got uh, Obama, uh, whatever his name was, Osama bin Laden, when they got him mm -hmm. in Pakistan, uh, suppose there was an American citizen who happened to be walking down the street and the, for, the uh, task force that went in there to shoot, uh, to shoot him, shot that American citizen, a president would be immune from prosecution for that, even without the Supreme case. I mean, it, it is true that there there has to be presidential immunity for certain acts. Uh, it's just that this Supreme Court decision in defining those acts was so broad that it, it uh, it just goes too far, but yeah, there 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 has to be presidential immunity for for certain acts that the president takes in his duty, as uh, and and maybe you know in a raid or something uh, overseas or even a raid in in the United States. I mean, you you can kill people, uh, and it's not murder if it's done in your official act. So, um, one other question in chat is that because that would not be at the perimeter of power, but in the core. Right. If it's a part of his core acts, a core um, core powers, he has absolute immunity according to this decision. 
That's exactly the same decision that they made in the uh, Nixon case, uh, except it had to do with civil liability. It didn't have to do with criminal liability. And what we would have hoped the Supreme Court would have done would have distinguished between core acts and civil liability and core acts and criminal liability and would said that it, and would say that if the president committed what was considered to be a criminal act, uh, even though in the process of carrying out his core powers, he would be subject to criminal prosecution because no man is above the law. That's what I think the Supreme Court should have said, uh, but they didn't. They took the civil case logic and applied it to a criminal case. May I say something? Um, sure. One of the core duties of the president is to pardon, and that was specifically mentioned in by Roberts in the case. <clears throat> now, I got my BA in history, and I, my, my areas were <laughs> Germany and the Soviet Union and Russia. Now, just look at this example. We required, I was just following orders. That wasn't good enough for us at Nuremberg. That wasn't it. I'm sorry you were following orders, but you still did wrong, and you are guilty of that. The president under this ruling could instruct the Joint Chiefs of Staff to kill someone. And the Joint Chiefs of Staff could indeed do that and then be held, the president would go ahead and pardon him for that action. This could happen over and over and over again. Now remember, and this is one thing that uh, I, I did not mention, the, one of the core things that the president has is to appoint the military in the military officers. All the generals, all the leaders of our army, air force, whatever the service is, if he puts people in there that are willing to do his bidding, which he can do, and by the way, Schedule F, you might have heard about that, that's not even necessary in my view anymore. He could go ahead and act under this immunity thing to go ahead and fire everybody in the government that doesn't agree with them. So we're in a very tenuous, very dangerous place right now. And what can we do about it? Vote. We got to keep the Senate. We have to do something about the Supreme Court and that the only place to do that is in the Senate. So we need that. And we need to control the people that are getting into powerful positions. That again is the Senate. The Senate goes and takes those nominees and votes them up or down. So we got to make sure our folks get elected, not just in the Senate, but also in the House, because they're nuts. And you know they're nuts. We got to, we got to put every, everybody on track. Everybody must vote. You don't vote, you're destroying democracy, because that's what this will do. Thank you, Tom and uh, Mark. I truly appreciate your presentations. We're going to open up the floor for about 15 minutes for a few other questions, and then we'll wrap up and be out of here by like 820. Um, anybody have any questions? President can only pardon for federal crime. State can still prosecute for violations of straight state criminal laws. Right. Does anybody have any other questions? If so, feel free to put them in chat. I'll read them or you can raise your hand or um, take yourself off mute. What happens now that Biden is not seeking re-election regarding Project 2025? Well, Project 2025 has nothing to do with Joe Biden. Project, as Mark said, Project 2025 is a product of the Heritage Foundation. And the people who wrote it, many of them are former Trump lawyers. They were employed in the Trump administration or are currently working in the Trump campaign. And the, the fear is Trump were elected, he would try to implement what's in Project 2025. There's no worry that Kamala Harris or Biden, if he were still running, would have anything to do with Project 2025. It is a very conservative Republican plan. 
not our plan. You got to recall too that this has already happened. Uh, when January sixth happened, who was in the uh, Department of Defense? Who was leading the Department of Defense? Temporary appointees appointed directly by Trump, who would carry out his policies, and they did. They did not provide troops. They would not provide troops on a timely basis whatsoever. That was part of this whole deal. It already happened once. It's going to happen throughout the entire government if this if Trump gets elected. Um, comment in chat. Biden can act with the immunity granted by the Supreme Court. He can apparently block a Trump victory, it seems. Well, it, we're... we're this thing is this immunity decision is so bad primarily because we have a man who is president who doesn't give a damn about the constitution about what's right and wrong biden cares he's not going to do anything like that counts. yeah or kamala harris is not going to we're not going to that that's why we've never had this situation before because this. they had even Richard Nixon understood that he was accountable to the law. Uh, Mark and Tom question um, going back to what Marianne asked earlier, which she has uh, posted again from this discussion. What are the main messages we can give to voters when we say you must vote? I, I think is look look at what Trump did when he was president. Look at what Trump says and look at what the Supreme Court has now said uh, he, he can do. And and look at what the 2025 project says uh, that he will do. And it's scary. I mean, it's a, it's a threat to democracy. And that's that's a message, I think, that we should be delivering. Mark, how, do you want to answer that? Uh, I agree completely with Tom. It's really hard to boil down a 900-page document into a couple of sound bites. It's really difficult to do that. Uh, all I can say is that our entire way of life will be affected, and we will become hungry at the best, and at the worst, we'll become like China or what the Soviet Union used to be. We will lose our democracy. It's as simple as that. Now, remember when Trump got in the last time, there were people around him, the so-called, uh, uh, what, I forgot what they were, grown-ups in the room. He's not going to have that this time around. He's going to, he, they are very well, they're preparing themselves very well to fill every slot and every advisor with a toady, with a yes man. That's not going to protect us at all, at all. He's not going to go through the staff over and over and over again because they try to hem him in. This is going to be free range illegality. Uh, the other thing too is like the the um, the clause in the Constitution, which is emoluments clause. Trump made millions and millions of dollars. His family made millions of dollars. He's accepted gifts from foreign lands. It's completely unconstitutional, but there's no enforcement mechanism. And he got away with it and he didn't care. And no one cared about it. The, the founders were very specifically concerned about a man like Trump. If you go ahead and read the, the discussions back then, the Federalist Papers, they were very worried about a specific Trump, a man just like him. And they were worried about the public being taken over by the emotions, like what happened in Germany. Our savior has come. Well, now we have our savior, right? He just got shot and got away with it, right? He didn't get killed. He must have been protected by God. This is really bad. It's really bad. And we have to cut through all the noise and do what's right for our country and for our constitution and our way of life. Otherwise, all is lost. Question in chat. What strategies? Oh, 
I moved too fast. Yeah. Um, what strategies here in Frederick County can we do to get this conversation out to people? A lot of people are not paying attention. Well, you're here. Tell everybody you know. And by the way, if they have any questions, have them contact Tom or I. Have them contact Mary. I mean, we'll, we will do our very best to let people know what the heck is going on and what could very well happen. So that's my best judgment here is to tell everybody you know. All right. Let people know. And, and don't stop. I think... Oh, it's go ahead. clear that the federal government, the Fed, not the federal government, the, the national campaign, the Harris, whoever she chooses as vice president candidate, this is going to be a big part of their yeah. strategy, their advertising, their message. And so, um, you know, we uh, we can't, I don't think local uh, parties can do a whole lot to change the message. The message is what the national organization that we can we can contact people and we can and we can hand out literature that has this message as developed nationally and and we need to do that and mary i, I don't know whether we should announce it yet but we're soon to have a headquarters and we're going to start sending out people knocking on doors and handing out literature and campaigning uh for both the president vice president u.s senator and congress and we're going to try to reach as many people as we can uh, with the message. And uh, that message will be developed nationally. Uh, but I'm sure it's going to include some of the things we talked about. I really suggest very much that you go ahead and look at that, look at 2025's um, uh, the preface and looking over section one, which is short, taking over the government. That's what it's called. It's not long. It'll give you a much better flavor of what they're doing than this short, very, very quick uh, 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 discussion was. Um, and then spread it around. You know a lot of people. It's, it's, it's exponential. I'm going to um, ask this one, these last two questions, one by Sherry, one by Caroline, and then I'm going to wrap um, this conversation up. So Sharon asked... Look, there is widespread agreement that Trump will not leave after four years. Why shouldn't Joe Biden use immunity to protect our democracy to, I just lost it, wait a minute, um, to protect our democracy by blocking his election? Well, that's wrong, don't make a right. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. I, 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 that it, we can't be like Trump. We just can't be that. We're better than that. And so, uh, first of all, we got to make sure he doesn't get elected uh, and uh, go from there. But, but we, we we can't we can't sanction measures that are unconstitutional, that are illegal, that are undemocratic to, uh, to prevent uh, Trump from getting reelected. We'd we'd be no better than Trump. There's two. There's two questions in relation to the convention, which I'll ask is one. The one is, uh, will the convention help to shape that nationally developed message and piggyback? And therefore, will the Frederick County de delegates have a voice? Well, yeah, I mean, yes and no. The, 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 the convention will shape that message. Will Frederick County delegates have any input to that? No. I mean, that's all done at a higher level than, than uh, Frederick County Delaware. Message, and they're working on that right now. They've been working on it, and now they're going to fine-tune it with a different candidate. But the message from the National uh, Convention is, is going to be all the things we've talked about, plus more. All the things Trump, I mean, all the things Biden and Harris have accomplished, and all the terrible things Trump has said and threatened to do in 2025, that'll all be message during the convention, I think. But smarter people than me or the other two or three delegates from Frederick are going to develop that message. And, you know, we'll be there. All right. Thank you all so much for your participation this evening. I just want to say a few closing words to wrap 
this up. Um, as we as we mentioned at the very beginning, this is literally just a broad overview, even though it did get weedy on some of the conversations about the SCOTUS rulings of choice that Tom and Mark wish to uh, speak on and the general, very, very general um, overview of Project 2025. I will be emailing everyone, not directly after the meeting, but at some time within the next 24 hours, I will email those that attended and those that registered but were unable to attend, the preface that Mark read from when he began his um, presentation that gave the a general overview of Project 2025, which points out what Karen had mentioned about women's rights, um, the cleansing of the DEI, L LGBTQ, when it comes to the language um, in the, um, national um, um, discussion when you're talking about individuals that are different than you. Um, and it will have all of that in that preface and give that general overview. You can use that to begin having conversations with those around you because it is discussed in layman's terms for um, anyone to be able to understand and digest and speak on. Um, I just saw the link that someone posted in chat. It moved too fast, so I don't know who did it. Thank you. I've got that link. I'll include the link uh, to the People Magazine's a summary of Project 2025. I'll include that as well. Mm -hmm. As been uh, discussed a few times this evening, most certainly how do we make that local is what Daryl Boffman said earlier, what Mark, Tom, and many of you have said, said, get engaged and vote. Why? Because Project 2025 lays out what will happen if we don't. Um, additionally, I just lost my train of thought. Um, oh, um, Angela Alsobrooks, if you, as you probably already know, is the candidate that's running for the Maryland U uh, U.S. Senate. Um, she, her team is having a day of action on August 3rd and 4th. She will not be here to my knowledge, but her team certainly will be here to be knocking on doors to help get the word out for her. There may be a dovetail to help canvas for April Delaney, who is running for Congress in uh, Congressional District 6. Um, for anyone that wants information about that, I will include that link in the email as well. As Tom mentioned, we as a party are going to be hosting some get out the vote efforts activities ourselves from our new um, headquarters. There's not a date yet for that, but um, we will be doing some phone banks. We'll be doing our own canvassing just to educate people on the fact that there is an election. Um, Melanie Galloway, who has asked some questions here this evening, she is she spearheads a postcarding um, um, effort here in Frederick County. She's been doing it for, gosh, what, eight, 10 years now, something like that. Uh, maybe four. Well, it feels like it's been eight to 10, but her team has uh, mailed out probably close to 30,000, 40,000 postcards. And that effort, that effort is very much active um, as we speak. I will include Melanie's name and email in that email as well, so that if you wish to get on her postcarding list, she can add you to that. Uh, additionally, don't forget that October 15th is the last day to register to vote or change party affiliations. So as you're talking with people, Make sure you're reminding them, get registered by October 15th. Get on, get online. Make sure your um, registration information is up to date and accurate. Early voting, October 24th through November 5th, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, that's Thursday through Thursday. And, of course, general election, Tuesday, November 5th. Um, 
Cindy had mentioned earlier about slides instead of having somebody read. Yes, most certainly I agree. That is not something that we did. And that is definitely a takeaway that we will remember moving forward. Marianne's question, and I'm glad she asked it twice about how can we talk about this to get people that aren't paying attention to pay attention, but in a way that is very natural. And so we will also be able to incorporate that in any conversations that we have moving forward as well. Um, I appreciate your time. We appreciate your participation. If for those of you that when you registered for tonight, if you said that you wish to be part of our email list because you aren't currently, we will get you added uh, within the next 48 to 72 hours to our email list. At the bottom of every email is an unsubscribe link if you feel that you're getting too many emails from us, uh, but we look forward to having you engaged in that way. We do have local democratic clubs. We have the Women's Democratic League. We have the South Frederick County Democrat, uh, South, Fre South Frederick County Democrats. We have North uh, Frederick County Democrats. We have Young Democrats and the United Democrats of Frederick County. I will include a link to a page that lists all of those clubs for anyone that might want to read up about that and maybe get engaged in that way. Um, Anything that you wish to ask us moving forward, don't hesitate to go to our website, frederickdemocrats.org, go to our contact us, send a question there, or send us an email at info at frederickdemocrats.org. Jessica, who is here this evening, as was going to be one of the hosts, and Amanda Stone Janez are very good on responding to our emails and uh, voicemails, um, sometimes three at least three times a week they're sending that those responses back and trying to make calls within two to three business days as well um i see that sharon has her hand up sharon i'm going to oh barbara put in chat that red wine and blue something i'll have to look at that and whatever that is i'll uh, include that as well oh, wait a minute. that might be the one that's a little itchy that's the one that's a little iffy. Mark yeah. says that he believes that the red wine and blue apparently is a little iffy. Um, of course, all of the opinions tonight are by what Mark and Tom has shared. It's <laughs> not the opinions of the Frederick County Democratic Central Committee or party. Um, but we appreciate your time and your thoughts. Don't hesitate to reach out to us and let us know if you have any questions, concerns, not only about Project 2025, but the Democratic Party itself. We want to be accountable to you and engaging with you. But for tonight, thank you so much. I hope everybody had a good evening and felt this was informative. I'll send a survey out by the end of the week so we can get your feedback from that as well. We always want to take your consideration into account as we plan and move forward. But for now, remember, vote, 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 vote only once. <laughs> Uh, but vote, vote, vote. <laughs> uh, interpreters, Lisa, Brad, thank you so much for your time this evening. Truly really appreciate it. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. We'll get this video on our YouTube, hopefully by the end of this week, as long as there are no issues. Good night, everyone. Thank Good you. Night. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Good night. Mary Lee, yes. Do you want to, do you want a technical volunteer? That would be wonderful. <laughs> Normally, um, the reason the diff the reason we had difficulty tonight. Oh, let me stop recording first. Yes, thank you. <laughs>